over the last few years, well, actually five years at this point, which is pretty crazy, I've made games in a lot of different fashions. And one of the things that I look back at and I appreciate a lot is that I focused on learning how I like to make games as opposed to maybe like min-maxing tutorials and, and, and really diving into learning how other people make games because it helped me fall in love with the hobby and understand like what works best for my brain. And as a solo developer, like that's all it really has to do is make sense for me so that when I come back and I look at my code and stuff like that, it, it makes sense and I can continue moving forward. I, I, I've really tried to not let myself get caught too deeply in the like over-engineering thing because I, I kind of understand or have always understood that my games don't need to be these technical marvels. They just need to work. And there's no bonus points if my game works super, super well or if it works 1% away from crashing completely. Like, as long as it works, that's all the player cares about. Uh, and so today I wanted to look at uh, my new game, a game about a black hole, and some some kind of uh, some game architecture that I've really enjoyed about this project specifically. And I've used it in different ways in my first two projects, Chess Survivors and Hexagod. Uh, but in a game about a black hole, it's been really differently because the main thing is I am partnering with somebody. His name is Corey. Also, uh, screen name is Thornity. You've probably seen him before on my Scope Creepers podcast. Um, and I mentioned him in a few other videos. Well, he is managing some of the balance of the game as well as um, bouncing ideas off of for d design and stuff like that. And one of the big things that we're doing uh, is we're separating the data layer of a game about a black hole from what Godot is doing. And this isn't new. This I didn't I didn't create this or discover this. This is a, a, a pretty standard way for most people to make games. But what is interesting is, I guess, how I'm using it in this regard. Because a game about a black hole is an incremental game. And that means that it's about getting these numbers to go big. And the big thing that you need to do is you really have to have these tech trees. Let me give myself some free matter here. These tech trees so that when you're doing the action, in this case, using your hovering of the mouse to click on the asteroids to break them, to collect matter to make your asteroid grow. You then get money, which you can come to a tech tree here, and you can spend to upgrade and buy these upgrades. Well, if we think about this from a data perspective, how do we set this up? How do we set up this tech tree? Because this is the game. This is kind of what I realized is like, Godot, all the code I have written here, and how I manage and like display asteroids, and like, what do I do with these different scenes? All of this stuff is kind of really just saying, given what's in this picked in this tech tree, if we say, instead of doing 27 asteroids, we buy this one for 34 asteroids and we go again, now the game is responsible for spawning 34 asteroids. And that's all a data layer. And that's what I think is really interesting is that now my job as the main developer of this game is to take all of the data that we get for how we want to build that upgrade tree and make sure that if we say, again, that asteroid number goes up, that the game responds to the asteroid number going up. If we say, uh, for example, that the clicker AOE is bigger now, and I put that at max 250%, which feels really good, I'll be honest with you. Like, look how much bigger this circle is. Uh, that feels really good and you can get more asteroids, but I need to make sure that the game can handle that data layer so that it can adjust to stuff on the fly. Um, and there's a few different ways you can actually approach something like this. And I, I'm, I'm a little addicted to this game, so I had to finish my run quickly. Um, there's a few different ways I've found to manage this because it's come up in Hexagod. Um, it's come up in Chess Survivors and stuff like that. And I kind of want to go through a few of my different processes of doing this. Um, the, the Maybe the simplest and the maybe the dumbest way possible is to simply define your data. So this is like the relics from Chess Survivors. Define your data and hard code it inside of the engine. I had to go back and find my 3.5 Godot and open it up. So all of these relics here, this says get Joker relic. It creates this relic for you on the fly, passing in an init function, which um, comes here and it extends relic. It basically fills out this, this reference or this resource um, to have the data that it needs to function as a relic. So it looks like the rarity of it, any mods it may be changing, the type of relic, the title, the icon, the type, all that stuff ends up being mapped in engine. And one of the really nice things that I found about this uh, is that if I wanted to find all of my different relics that change the, um, let's say the, the player level up heal. So whenever the player levels up the heal, I can do control F on this um, sheet 
and I can find and look through and then go through and individually tweak all of these relics. And that's been pretty nice as far as like, uh, I remember like, yes, this file becomes unwieldy. Like this is literally has like 60 relics and it has over a thousand, um, over a thousand lines of code, but it is all simply just defining the data. And then if I have different things I want to change, I can easily search for that in the project. And like, Hey, Immers from the Future Hero, if you want to support the channel and me and, and help me feed my cats, the best way to do that right now is to go check out Hexagod, Chess Survivors, and Wishlist, a game about a black hole. Hexagod and Chess Survivors are on sale right now, and if you want an even bigger discount, there is an Aramis bundle, which includes Hexagod and uh, Chess Survivors, and eventually a game about a black hole will be part of that as well. If not, and you want to help me out, leave a comment, like it, subscribe to the channel, you know all that fun stuff. It actually... S shockingly it does actually help a lot when i do say that so i appreciate the support let's dive right back in there's been issues where i forget a comma or i don't pass in the information and the game breaks or blows up and like there's there's definitely drawbacks to this but one of the things i really liked about this hard coding approach is it kind of just naturally grew it had really uh easy initial implementation for me it was stupidly simple um and then it kind of just expanded from there and, and it kind of just worked for me with this project. Uh, and like, is it optimal? I don't really know, but it, I've had no performance impacts for something like this. So um, this is one option is you can just define all of your data in in simply in code and have it render. And I'm sure if you're a GigaChad programmer, you might be sitting there and being like, Aramis, you're such a stupid person. But remember, I know that I'm a stupid person and I'm a simple monkey who's just trying to make games and learn how to make fun games in the process. And this was one of my attempts and it worked perfectly fine. Um, things we do don't always have to be these super optimal um, technological advancements and your own game can be a great example of that. Uh, the next thing that I have been doing in Chess Survivors is actually taking that same idea and abstracting it out into a resource. And uh, what this lets you do is you define this resource, you can define some export variables, and then in the UI, you can have a bunch of different resources defined. So this example, also relics in Hexagod, you can set the stuff um, from the UI perspective. And so if I pop into Hexagod here, this is a 4.4 project. If I wanted to change the type of relic now, it's because it's driven off of this enum, this util.relic types. I can grab it from a dropdown. I can change its rarity from a dropdown. I can change the max number of it. I can then uh, add different effects, which are also an array. I can then start adding an effect. So if I wanted to say for Argus's hammer here, if I wanted to add a new effect, now I have this dropdown of all of these different resource effects that I can click into and then I can define specific data with inside of it. So this one's saying, whenever you gain six stone, gain one brick. But if I wanted to, for whatever reason, change it from stone to you gain a water, I can easily do that in the UI. Um, one of the drawbacks of something like this is you can't control F your resources. Maybe there's something where you could go into the actual files and find it and stuff like that. And maybe there's other tools out there that could help with that process. But the the drawback of this is that eventually the data management of this becomes like quite a bit and you have to kind of remember what you're doing like right now i have i think 20 relics but if all of a sudden that becomes 200 relics you can see that gets a little bit messier as a design uh, but it still works. It's doable. I like the flexibility of being able to, because of this solution, the why, why I've gone with this is because if you see here, all of the different effects here, I'm probably when all said and done, I'm going to have like 200 effects in this game or something. And if I want to start like adding those effects dynamically and customly, putting that in a, maybe, maybe the first idea of hard coding, it would work fine. Um, and maybe that'd be something I do I do go back to because this kind of does become unwieldy as far as a management source. And the third option, which I'm going to talk about here for a game about a black hole, doesn't fit because the data of this gets to be really, really, uh, really big. Like initially when I was doing uh, uh, Hexagod, I have too many games now. I was doing something like this where you have data files. And so you have defined, this is for a game about a black hole, but you define a bunch of columns and rows in here. And you say, given this information, when I export this out either as a CSV or I have this extension to do uh, exporting to a JSON file, and there's a video uh, 
before in the channel, maybe I'll link it in the top, that talks about how to do this exporting and stuff like this and how do you import it into your game. But you basically define all the data through a spreadsheet or however you wanna define that data and then you ingest that into the game as a uh, basically a file that you can go ahead and then uh, load in. So if I go to my upgrade manager here, um, I'm loading in this JSON file and then I'm going through here and grabbing out the type, the, the cell locations, um, any variables like the cost, the max values, and all those different things to basically create the data layer of a game about a black hole. And um, this also has its drawbacks. Let's say you wanna go ahead and like visually change where things are located in this grid. That is not an easy thing to do with data view just like this. And so what Thornity ended up doing is he went in and created a little bit of a Godot tool to be able to position things, to be able to click on a cell and change the variables on the fly so that we can visually look at our tech tree and see what we want to do. And this took a little bit of effort up front, but I think in the long run, it's going to pay off a lot for us in this project to be able to really have this separation of this data layer. And then the Godot side of it is me just having to implement the mods. And so the I guess the final option that I've tried out here is just having a data file. And so far, this has been something that I like quite a bit, specifically for an incremental game, because I've realized... I've realized that this is the game. This is the balance of it. And so we can even go ahead and have a few different trees out there that have all these different <clears throat> upgrades and changes and all these things because at the end of the day, the game just has to say, okay, well, we have our click rate of not 120%, now it's 130%. How do, what does the game do to change that? What does the game do to actually make it so you click more often or you deal more damage or X, Y, and Z thing happens? And being able to do that has actually made, in my opinion, my code feel a little bit cleaner. It's made my to-do list a little bit easier because then I'm really just coming into a game about a black hole, looking at my, uh, I have, I call them mods. Um, these are like the modifiers I'm doing. And then having this list of all these modifiers to say, what am I doing? Where am I using this? How am I changing it? Like click AOE here, I can control shift F, click AOE. I can find in the game, what is click AOE doing? And I can look here and say, okay, well in my clicker class, which is, uh, let me pull up clicker, 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 here we go. Um, in this clicker class here, it is grabbing that value and just simply gonna be changing the scale of both the collision shape uh, and then the art here, that art pivot so that it, it scales up correctly, boom. There's one added in. If all of a sudden we want to add in minions or we want to add in an explosion effect or we want to add in all these things, it's it's really separated away from having to have this project be like also the game and the data layer. And so then if we want to like one of our ideas we had in the long run of a game about a black hole is what if we had like three or four different styles of this game? Like this could be the core idea where you're doing this kind of hovering over the nodes um, to mine them out. And it's all about trying to min max your power, that dopamine hit of you breaking things down, of you growing more powerful, of you feeding this black hole, making it big enough to suck in the screen. But what if we also had a balance that was strictly around minions and idling? And so you start off doing stuff, but very quickly you run out and all of a sudden you could see how the content of the game could blow up to be five or six different maps that have um, different upgrades. Maybe each map has five or six unique mods to that to that tech tree layout but then the game itself doesn't actually bloat up any bigger we're just adding in different level selectors and stuff like that to be adding in more and more content and so then we're really really separating the game and what's rendered from the data of the game and again this isn't anything new i understand that but i think this is something that in this game in this last week of working with Corey and having me go back and forth of saying, I'm working on that, I'm fixing this thing, and then him coming in and having the balance and changing the thing through his little tool here um, has really shown me how the production side of this, once we like, we're, I think we're moving into production right now, is really gonna ramp really quickly and we're gonna run so fast in the like the last three months of this project, which is kind of the goal. My goal is to get um, a game about a black hole, game about a black hole, 
um, done, I, I want to get the Steam demo released on September 15th. The um, October Next Fest is October 15th, and we want to really try to hit the November 15th launch as well. So make sure you go and wishlist the game so that you can play it and give me feedback when the demo goes live. And because I like seeing the numbers go up, just like I like seeing the the uh, if you give me more likes on this video and you leave nice little comments and stuff like that, that helps boost my uh, my own self confidence, which is something I'm working on in therapy, so that I myself can be deriving my own confidence from my own skills, my own abilities, my own learnings, and that's something I'm going to be keep tackling and sharing with you along the journey. I'm a dumb monkey. I have no idea what I'm doing and that hasn't really changed. I've kind of just becoming more and more comfortable with that fact. I hope you had a great Friday. If you're playing Path of Exile 2 this weekend, I'll see you out there. Um, I've been Aramis. I had too much coffee today and it's been a really nice day. So I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.